Good afternoon. I'm Elaine Murado, for those that don't know me, I'm serving as the dean right now for the School of Public Health, and we're delighted that you've um, come today to listen to our fireside chat, um, if you will, um, with, uh, with our, our guest speaker here today. I know also that uh, we have at least 10 on, the, on our Zoom line. We had uh, sent this announcement out to, I know, our pub, um, the Colorado um, Public Health Improvement Steering Committee, so there may be folks from local public health as well as state, as well as other groups affiliated with that Improvement Steering Committee. So um, if um, a bit of just details before I introduce everyone um, in terms of logistics, for those that are on the, on the uh, Zoom line, your lines are muted so that if you are wanting to ask any questions when we get to the question period, you can chat to Elizabeth Wyatt, um, who can then relay it to the panelists. So thank you. So now I'd like to introduce our featured speaker, as well as who's going to be on our panel after um, he, Tony gives some opening comments. And I think it will be very interesting to see the, and hear uh, the interplay with what's happening at a federal, uh, national level, and how our state leaders are adapting or um, adjusting to, to that information as it flows. So with us today is Tony Masachi. He, he's the Senior Director for Policy and Research at the Association of Schools and Programs of Public Health. I got to meet him last summer in our section retreat for those that are public health practice folks and was just really um, fascinated with the insights and learning. This is what we teach in class, and to actually see it and talk to someone that does it is, I, I think, very exciting for me. So he was gracious uh, enough to come visit our school as one of the members in the association, and so I think we're very fortunate. He joined the um, ASPPH um, in uh, 2014, and at that um, position, he has a principal responsibility for developing and effectively advocating for the policy positions of the association and really advancing the capacity uh, in support of public health research faculties to conduct critical population-based and prevention-oriented research. So he works closely with our association's legislative and research committees, and he provides support for the population health leadership group. Um, and he gets to travel to different schools and programs and brings a perspective of what others are doing um, across the country as well. He also um, sends out weekly uh, a policy update um, in which he does the digest. And it's been fascinating over the last few months to see all of that information. And so this is an opportunity to kind of hear a spotlight version of it. After he gives a few um, remarks, um, Carol Runyon will be... Um, moderating a panel. Um, Carol is a professor in our Department of Epidemiology, um, and she'll be moderating a panel with three uh, leaders in the state. Um, I'll just go through briefly here. Sarah Miller, who's the Executive Director of the Colorado Foundation for Public Health and the Environment, and she's led efforts to enhance, plan, and implement public health and environmental health related to programs and surveillance activities and strategies. She's also an adjunct professor in our Department of Health Systems Management and Policy. Um, Sarah Schmidt is with us as well. She's the Director of Community Health Policy at the Colorado Health Institute. Um, and there uh, she works on a wide range of health issues, including cost drivers, oral health, payment reform, and population health. And she's the one that conducts studies um, related to promoting healthy eating and, and active living. And last, we also are fortunate to have Dr. Larry Wolk, who's the Executive Director and Chief Medical Officer of the Colorado Department of Public Health and Environment. And since joining CDPHE in 2013, his mission has been to simplify the health system for citizens of Colorado and to position the department as a leader in providing evidence-based health and environmental health information. So the panel piece of the discussion is, is hopefully um, going to you know, again, look at that interplay between what's happening federally and how local leaders are adapting and what this means or might mean for public health in Colorado. So I'm going to turn it over to Tony, and then um, Carol will be the one um, moderating. So thank you. Great. Thank you very much for coming. Really appreciate it. Um, I'm going to show a few slides, some of which I showed this morning, but we'll try to whip through them pretty quickly so that people don't get bored if you were here earlier. Uh, but also want to leave plenty of time for discussion, so I'll try to limit my remarks. Um, you know, I just, because I have to, 
about who ASPPH is, we represent uh, the Association of Schools and Programs of Public Health, which are all the CEF accredited schools, as well as the 55 or so largest programs that are also CEF accredited. And we serve as their advocate in Washington, along with providing key services to the schools and programs. Uh, we have, as I said, about 110 members at any given time, about 59,000 students, 11,000 faculty, uh, and 20,000 graduates. Of course, this, as you, many of you know, there's been a huge growth in undergraduate public health programs, and we're starting to represent those uh, folks as well. So um, everything that we do tends to be one degree away from being a public health issue. And so on the advocacy front, I am constantly pressed to advocate for this cause or that cause. Uh, often a dean has a pet project that we all support, but I have to make a judgment about how much political capital we can expend. We don't have a uh, political action committee. Uh, we don't have a grassroots movement. We have VIP members who can get in to see their congressman and senator, but we have to marshal what resources we have. And so with the help of our legislative committee, we put together an advocacy taxonomy about the range of activities that we could do, and we decided these are the three areas where we should spend about 80 or 90 percent of our advocacy effort. And those things that we actually have evidence to bear and can be a debate participant with something to give. Uh, where we can really be actively engaged and make a difference. And lastly, a prime mover. Programs that are important to our schools uh, and programs but don't have another champion, uh, like the um, Prevention Research Centers is a good example. So generally the issues that come before us, there's a, a range that goes from uh, activities and issues, could be regulation, could be legislation, that uh, directly affects the schools and programs. Uh, a second range are those that um, sort of either violate or affirm the values of academic public health, but don't actually affect the school per se. So, for example, the preventive services uh, essential benefit under the Affordable Care Act. And then uh, there are other issues that will affect the practice area of our graduates and the availability of jobs for them out in the community. And again, like the Affordable Care Act, uh, it's incentive programs to advance population health through the CMMI initiatives. Um, so a little bit about the political environment. Obviously, I chose this for a reason. It's been kind of weird in Washington. Um, you know, the new administration has had a rough start. And when it makes a mistake, it seems to dig. Uh, one of the first rules in politics is to know when to stop digging. And they haven't figured that out yet. Also seems much more intent uh, about breaking some windows rather than, you know, putting, getting a hole in one. It's more fun to break things at this point. And the question is how fast will they change and learn if they do? Uh, I have to say, within Washington, there is some Trump fatigue. I mean, recognizing that he has been in office today only 76 days. Uh, yet, it's been pretty intense, 76 days. So, um, we'll see how it continues. Uh, he's eating up a lot of the oxygen inside the Beltway, to say the least. So... Um, this is a famous book in Washington called The Plum Book, which details the positions that are available to any new administration to nominate or appoint people to federal government positions. And one of the major problems that the administration has had has, has been its very slow start in making nominations. So as of yesterday, uh, of the 553 key positions requiring Senate confirmation, the Trump administration has had 22 people confirmed. They've formally nominated another 19 others. They've announced the nomination of 26, but the paperwork's not done, so they haven't actually gone to the Senate yet. And there are 486 positions that have not either been publicly or privately announced. This is stunningly slow for any administration. 
And some of it is clearly intentional in that they are advancing cuts in programs that they do not want a, uh, a champion on board to fight uh, them on. Uh, but it's, uh, it's rather stunning, and it has really hampered them in the policy development area. They just don't have a bench of people to vet policies and programs if they wanted to have them vetted. And of most concern to us is there are 46 key positions that are generally considered science-related positions. And to date, only one of them has been filled. And that is the nomination of Scott Gottlieb to be the Food and Drug Administrator. And he's still going through the confirmation process. So uh, just to give you an idea, under the Obama administration, the Office of Science and Technology policy within the White House had 150 FTEs. Right now, there's not a soul in that office. And so when it comes to science issues, there is nobody there to even call and ask for advice and counsel. And of course, as an advocate, that also is a challenge because there's nobody for me to call and advocate to. So I can't really affect policy in a vacuum. So just the Senate, um, because of Trump's victory, people kind of lost track of where the Senate and the House were for a while. And, you know, the Democrats did pick up a couple of seats. The, uh, the, uh, the, uh, what, what are the, one of the things that happens when the Republican majority or any party's majority is so small is that each member becomes a king. They can demand changes and programs and initiatives in exchange for their vote. And so it makes governing very, very difficult. Um, also in the background is internal concern about 2018. So those 34 seats, uh, 30, uh, yeah, 34 seats that are up for election so every, you know, there's 33, 33, and 34 seats up. It rotates around uh, on that 34th seat. Uh, those were seats that were last contested during the election which Obama won his second term. And the Democrats did extremely well. And so next time, there are going to be 23 Democratic seats up for re-election and two independents who caucus with the Democrats, and only nine Republican seats. And some of the Democratic seats are in states that are going to be very difficult to hold. Trump won handily in Montana, for example, and West Virginia, North Dakota. Those are seats that are going to be a real challenge for the Democrats to hold on to. And they're going to have to spend an inordinate amount of money to, for those battles. So... The Republicans have, some of them think they have a good chance of getting a filibuster-proof majority in the Senate in the 2018 election. Then we have the House. Uh, the majority of the Republicans narrowed there. There are now five vacancies because of appointments and other elections. Uh, it looks as though the Democrats would need to pick up 25 seats to flip control of the House. That is a daunting task, even if there is a wave election, because unlike earlier times, many of these seats have been gerrymandered to almost guarantee that they won't, they won't be competitive. So I wouldn't count on either house flipping in 2018. So one of the challenges, of course, has been the, the uh, Freedom Caucus. Uh, some people think it has a, a higher majority than 33. It's an outgrowth of the Tea Party. It has been unwilling to uh, form a caucus with other Republicans uh, on most issues, and it was clearly the reason that the effort to repeal the ACA fell apart a couple weeks ago. It continues to challenge the leadership in the House. Uh, the Speaker probably would have tumbled uh, if there was anybody in line to replace him. Uh, the line that's going around Washington is that nobody wants to be Henry VIII's next wife. And, uh, you know, nobody wants to fill Ryan's shoes because they face the same problem that Ryan has, and it's the same problem that John Boehner had when he was Speaker, that it's really, really difficult to put together a governing uh, uh, coalition. 
And Ryan has made it clear he does not want to go and, and uh, uh, work with Democrats on any issues. So it, it's going to be tough to find a ruling coalition. And we have a majority-based system. We're not a parliamentary system. So it, it becomes very, very difficult. Uh, talk a little bit about funding. Uh, you know, there's a saying uh, in most academic circles, no margin, no mission. Uh, you need to have money to, to do what you want to do. Uh, our schools bring in about $7.4 billion in funds. Uh, the key number is $2 billion, $92 million in grants and contracts. The vast majority of that is federal support, about $1.5 billion. The biggest payer is the National Institutes of Health, about 60 a percent of the money that goes uh, to research grants to our schools comes from NIH. Even though there is no National Institute of Public Health, no National Institute of Preventive Sciences, we're sprinkled throughout all of the 26 NIH institutes and centers. Uh, federal money is critical to all phases of academic public health. So we have a lot of contracts with um, state health agencies. Uh, ASTO reported in the last published survey, which is a little old, FY11, but I'm sure it's only gotten more severe, is that federal funds provide 53% of funding to state health agencies. And some of that money flows to our schools under contracts and service agreements. Um, elect, uh, education support is now more heavily uh, loaded with federal support than it is state support. Uh, I first learned at my, one of my earlier visits to the University of Colorado that some of the leadership here said that uh, University of Colorado was a state-located school rather than a state-supported school. And that's true all around the country as state government budgets have plummeted. And as a result, that's one of the reasons why tuition is what it is. Uh, in Washington, of course, it's been heavily dominated by uh, uh, deficit politics for the last eight to ten years. Uh, you can see why. Uh, but all of the focus has been on domestic discretionary spending, which is this line here. And as you can see, it goes from about 6.8% of uh, gross domestic product down to 52 That's a significant drop over time. Well, meanwhile, interest has gone up. Social Security has gone up. Other major health care programs have gone up. So key budget dates. We're in the six-month period of FY17. There still is no appropriations bill. Uh, there is a continuing resolution, and it expires on April 28th. Reportedly, the appropriators have reached agreement, and there likely will be... Um, a bill passed the week they get back after the Passover and Easter holiday. Uh, we're hopeful that NIH and CDC will get a small increase. Uh, earlier this year, May 16th, uh, March 16th, Trump released what was called a skinny budget for FY18, which begins in October. Uh, he will release a more detailed budget in the middle of May. Uh, and we can talk a little bit about what was in that skinny budget. And then, of course, October 1st is the start of the new fiscal year. But it also is the date that the debt limit extension is necessary so that the Federal Treasury can continue to borrow money uh, to satisfy our debt. So it's a tr potential train wreck on October 1st. So Trump announced numerous budget cuts in, that he intended for, uh, to uh, have Congress enact for FY18. What's important to note is that these budget cuts come on top of other cuts or other reductions in growth that uh, the agency doesn't overcome um, inflation. So, for example, the uh, Environmental Protection Agency, uh, Trump is calling for a 28 or so percent reduction in the skinny budget. Well, that would bring the cut since 2010 down to over 50 percent of the EPA's resources. Uh, same with HHS. Within the skinny budget, he did not outline exact numbers for most agencies, but he did for some. Um, well, first, this one, just to give you an impact of the impact on NIH on this. And NIH is viewed as a favored agency on Capitol Hill. And you can see how 
Even NIH, one of the most favored agencies, has had a huge gap develop between the resources that it has to do its mission. In fact, its actual spending level is now in, uh, in, in, in uh, constant dollar terms below what it was in 2002. To, you know, um, and of course, as a result, success rates have gone uh, plummeting, meaning how much more competitive the grants uh, action is. Um, within the budget proposal for 2018, Trump called for a $5.8 billion reduction in NIH. Um, he also called for folding the Agency for Healthcare Research and Quality into NIH, but didn't provide any additional resources. So uh, ARC has about a $400, billion, $400 million budget, and so he would transfer the mission of ARC, but not that $400 million. Now, how it would be funded, no one knows. He also proposed to kill the Fogarty International Center, which is the global health research funding arm of NIH. It is by far the smallest institute and center at NIH, only funds about $50 million in activity. But anything that had a global or international flavor to it was targeted in Trump's budget. And of course, the EPA cuts were devastating. 50 or more programs, 25% staff reduction, um, draconian. So um, when Secretary of HHS Price spoke about the budget last week before Congress, he outlined that he expected the $5.8 billion that they're proposing to be cut from NIH would, be, would come from indirect costs. Indirect costs for those who don't play the game, uh, when you get a grant for uh, X amount of money, the institution that supports the grant gets additional money to help pay for costs that cannot be identified to your specific grant. Often it's infrastructure support, the parking lots, the lights, electricity, the library, uh, a whole set of functions and many of which are on the administrative side that are to um, comply with federal compliance mandates, such as the Institutional Review Board, the Animal Use and Care Committee, the uh, biohazards training, uh, all of these things. And at many institutions, this is essential money to, at every institution, it's essential money to keep the lights running uh, and, and to keep the research going. He astoundingly said that it uh, was that that indirect cost money did not support research. And of course, anybody who knows anything about indirect cost, that's exactly what it supports. I mean, it is based on how much research you do, and it's a percentage kick on to pay for the lights. It's to pay for real costs. Uh, interestingly, NIH has not paid any more in indirect costs than it has in the past. The numbers haven't moved hardly at all over the years. It's 27.5%, did go up to 279 but came back down. It's been fairly level. It's not much of an issue. Now, most institutions have rates much higher than this, um, and we'll get to that in just a second, how that works. But Andy Harris, who is a former... Johns Hopkins faculty member, and now a member of the committee, he compared it to voluntary health groups and said that, you know, when the American Lung Association issues a research grant to a researcher at Hopkins, it pays no indirect costs. Well, this really is apples and oranges because it allows direct charging of many of the things that the federal government puts in the indirect cost line. So, for example, it allows you to purchase a, a secretary or the time of a secretary. It allows you to make all kinds of other fees and adjustments that the federal government doesn't allow. So it really is apples and oranges. This is from Nature, which did a study on indirect costs. And the, um, uh, the negotiated rate, which is set, and, and it's, that's a euphemism because there's really very little negotiation involved. You, you submit data, the federal government looks at the data, and then it comes out and tells you what your indirect cost rate is. It, it's a black box negotiation. Um, but then there is the 
calculated rate. And that calculated rate is based on that not all costs are eligible for indirect costs. It's based on modified uh, direct costs. But you can see how much lower it is. I believe the University of Colorado, I'm not sure at this campus, but I think it's around 55% maybe 55.5% if uh, last time I looked, but it, it's there. But I would say, like these other institutions, the effective rate is probably about 32%. And it varies greatly sometimes the locale. Obviously, Memorial Sloan Kettering in downtown Manhattan has a much higher indirect cost rate because of its facilities costs than the University of South Dakota does. And as I said, it's based on modified direct. There's lots of things that you don't get indirect cost on. One of the challenges to the research enterprise is that almost no one thinks that the federal government pays the real and full cost of research. That in many cases, and in most cases, it is subsidized by the institution. And when I was at uh, the Association of American Medical Colleges, I commissioned a study by Euron that looked at under-recovery of costs and what these, in effect, become is cost sharing by the institution. The institution is saying, we will spend money because we feel this research is important to our community, to our faculty, to our institution. It allows us to leverage other awards. It allows us to create a, an intellectual base for other activities. But... Um, Overall in the nation, and this was based on medical school data, not public health school data, it was found that for every dollar an institution brings in, the institution kicks in about 53 cents. And some of those costs are very clear. Under recovery, uh, departmental research, uh, additional salary support because of the NIH salary cap, startup packages, bridge funding, etc. All of these things are considered cost sharing. And the one certainty with the current budget situation is that the cost sharing will be greater going forward. And one of the implications of that is, is if you don't have resources to cost share, you probably can't play in the research game. So if we're going to see the research performer pool shrink. Those with a large endowment who have clinical income to offset some of these costs, other income, philanthropy, they may be okay. But if you don't have any of those things, it's going to be very tough to compete. And there's a little bit of naivete going on among some of the, the research faculty, especially in the basic sciences, not so much here, is that, oh, you know, cutting indirect costs would be great. We'll just put it in the direct pool. You know, that means more grants money. We'll have it in the direct pool. But that's naive. The Office of Management and Budget wants these savings for other priorities that they have. This isn't a, you know, Robin Hood thing. They're going to give to the, you know, to the needy. They're going to give it to building the wall, other priorities that Trump has. They're not going to give it to back to the research enterprise for direct grants. So right after the skinny budget, Trump released a supplemental budget to ask the government, ask the Congress to cut $18 billion in FY17 money, we're halfway through, as a partial payment on the wall. Now the wall, the estimates by the, by the Border Patrol and the Customs Service now is that the wall will cost approximately $70 billion. Okay? So that is two and a half times the NIH budget. And that does not include land acquisition costs, which could be high. So the initial $18 billion that he wants would do planning, sites, start buying land. And he proposed a whole set of very specific cuts to come up with that $18 billion. And some of those cuts hit home. So, for example, under... The uh, public health programs cuts, he wants to cut uh, the injury prevention center, the prevention research centers. Under the HRSA cuts, he wants to cut the uh, public health training center program. Under NIOSH, he wants to cut the education and research center program. Those are all things that you have on your campus that help contribute to the intellectual vitality of this institution. Um, there are all kinds of other cuts, and as you can see, 
anything that is focused on global or international is slashed. Congress is likely to reject these cuts, in part because they already have a deal and they can't go back. But I think we need to pay attention to these because when Trump releases his FY18 budget in the middle of May, you can be sure these cuts will be there. And so where do these cuts come from? I mean, if he doesn't have staff to develop these things, how is he coming up with these? And the fact is they were taken directly from a Heritage Foundation report. Heritage Foundation is a very conservative think tank funded by the Koch brothers and other conservative benefactors. And the cuts come directly from this Heritage document, which aims to have a balanced budget in the next five years. Three years, it'll have a balanced budget, but minus uh, uh, um, debt payments. But it's, it's a draconian strategy to balance the budget. So one of the things that's happened is when you're fighting for resources in Washington, things can get pretty ugly. Because the only money that you're going to get for your program means you have to pick somebody else's pocket. And so there is likely going to be a very messy civil war among domestic discretionary programs for resources. So I do not want to go after the health, the state health agencies block grant money. And they don't want to take money from the prevention research centers. So, you know, but there are people, you go in to visit an office, they say, oh, fine, we'd love to give it to you, but who should we cut? And I refuse to answer that question. That's why they ran for office, and that's how they got elected. It's up to them to make that suggestion. I have ideas. I know where I would like to see priorities realigned, but, but that's a, a legislative decision. I can only make the case for what good the programs that we support do. Uh, just mention one other thing. During the campaign, uh, the president said he was going to impose a hiring freeze. He said he would exempt military, public safety, and public health. One of his very first presidential memorandums imposed the hiring freeze, but it left out the public health exemption, only national security or public safety responsibilities. Um, with some of the acting heads of HHS, we were able to get an exemption memo out that allowed a number of categories of jobs to be exempted, social work, microbiology, toxicology, environmental health and safety, epidemiology, um, and some that were exempted with pre-approval. Um, this is fading away quickly, and it's fading away for a number of reasons. One of the things we were most concerned about was whether the fellowship and internship programs funded by the federal government would be subject to the hiring freeze. They are, unless they are paid through other monies. So ASPPH runs a variety of fellowship programs and internship programs, and those fellows and interns receive checks from us. And so they're safe. If the check is cut by the federal agency, they're in trouble and subject to the hiring freeze. One of the larger problems is the shrinking federal workforce. You know, this hiring freeze implies that, oh, there's a problem with the federal workforce. Well, federal employment has never been lower. It right now is 1.93% of, um, of civilian non-farm employment, and it has been plummeting down. And what's even worse is there's a new GAO report out that's just been updated from this version that shows that 34% of federal civilian employees now qualify for retirement. And we're seeing the offices at NIH and other public health service agencies packed with people saying, I'm not going to stick around for this, for this nightmare. And we, these are all senior people, most of whom have more than 30 years of service. And so there's a drain of intellectual capital out of the federal agencies. Now, this is a great opportunity for our students to get federal jobs, but, but the, uh, the impact on the agencies and their mission is going to be quite dramatic. And, of course, EPA will suffer just for political reasons. Uh, they are going to see, they're seeing a huge outflow already with people deciding, let's retire now rather than wait for a reduction in force. Last thing I'll talk about is student loans. Uh, federal contribution to student loans has skyrocketed. Um, 
and you can see the red is um, is uh, private backed, federally guaranteed private loans. The blue are federal direct loans. There is some controversy on the Hill. Lamar Alexander, the chair of the uh, Health Education Labor Panel in the Senate, wants to get rid of the Grad Plus loan program, which supports a lot of graduate students. He doesn't think, it's a philosophical argument, he doesn't think the federal government should be giving loans to graduate students for their studies. They're going to make a ton of money at the end of the day. Public health is an exception to this making a boatload of money, but it's hard to make that case with other health professions that use the Grad Plus program. And so, uh, and what's odd about this is the federal government actually makes money on the Grad Plus program. So it would have a negative implication on the budget situation if they went ahead with it. But they also are raising serious questions about some of the income-based repayment plans, most notably the Public Service Loan Forgiveness Program. And this is critically important not only for the graduates of our schools that go work in uh, public service, but it also will impact those that go to work for uh, federal, uh, state and local agencies as well if they're not eligible for these public service loans. Uh, the loan forgiveness part of this actually kicks in in October. One had to make 10 years of continuous payments before being eligible for loan forgiveness. That comes up in October. We don't know how many people will apply, but it could be significant. Thus, it creates a liability for the federal government that they don't really know how extensive that is. And there's also been a feud between agencies and administrators over the definition of public service. So it, there was a lawyer that worked for the Vietnam Veterans of America doing disability uh, uh, claims. They said at first that that was a public service job, and after this person had made nine years of payments, they then ruled that that wasn't a public service job. And he's gone to court saying, you know, I would have made a different career choice if this had been the law. He had a letter of determination saying you are eligible and you are qualified. So this will be out in the courts for a while. So uh, Affordable Care Act, it will come back. I, I won't go into uh, much on this because we're running out of time and I want to leave time for the panel. So um, I will just end it there. So if the panel would come up to the front, and, uh, <clears throat> and there will be time for audience questions as well. So we've invited uh, three panelists, as Elaine said, uh, and asked them to, to reflect a little bit. Yeah, and ask them to reflect a little bit on how some of these federal issues are affecting their operations, either in state government or um, private um, organizations in the state. So, um, if you'll each just talk a little bit about that. Um, and then we'll open up for general discussion. So Sarah, either Sarah, Sarah Miller, do you want to start? We have two Sarahs. Why don't you start? Yeah, no, I was going to have you. Um, actually, I don't know. If we could put you on the spot. Because it feels like so much of what sure. I talk about might really work. We're, we're having a strategy discussion. Yeah. So, All right. Is this working? Or can I talk loud enough? You guys in the back can hear me. Okay? Well, we need to keep the microphones recorded. on because it's being oh. recorded. So if it doesn't work, you can take the mic. Hello. Okay. I think this is on. Uh, again, uh, Larry Wolk. I'm the Chief Medical Officer and Executive Director at um, CDPHE, which is uh, the State uh, Health Department or Public and Environmental Health Department. So appreciated uh, your comments very much. Um, I'll um, uh, give you kind of my perspective, which dovetails uh, into this um, quite nicely. I think you heard in the introduction, my goal is to try and keep things simple. <clears throat> I think it's really hard 
for lay people, let alone people like us who are professionals in this industry, to try and keep track of all the moving parts right now. And so um, the first thing that I like to try and make sure people are aware of is the timing, uh, which you, you highlighted very nicely, which is that people are throwing numbers out fast and furious, and you lose track of fiscal year 17 versus 18, or they say 17, 18, or they say state fiscal year. And we're on a, a state fiscal year of July 1st. Uh, the federal fiscal year is on October 1st. And so... Um, the first thing I tell people is, uh, unless something happens with that fiscal year 17 cuts that uh, the Trump administration has proposed, which is unlikely to happen, um, we have a little bit of time to evaluate what these potential changes um, are and how to deal with them. Um, the second thing is uh, to be aware, and as you pointed out also, um, the State Department of Public Health and Environment uh, operates on about a half a billion dollar a year budget, 55% um, or so, so almost exactly based on the ASTHO data that you presented, comes from federal sources. Um, and of the state sources that we get, the majority of our funding actually comes from cash funds, uh, which is money that we charge uh, for permits or money that we charge for fees or money that we charge for contracts. And we get very little, relatively speaking, of state general fund, although it is precious dollars when we do get it, like things like $5 million for school-based health centers or $2 million to help supplement our family planning initiative and the LARC program. Um, so um, uh, it, it's important uh, for us to keep that in perspective because if there are dramatic changes at the federal level, um, it really impacts our department probably more than almost any other department. That, that being said, almost any other department, uh, the one department that gets a significant amount of federal funding uh, is Medicaid or healthcare policy and finance. And so the one thing that I would add to supplement the information is it's hard sometimes for us in public health to wave our hands and get attention from uh, our legislators or even our governor uh, when uh, Medicaid, uh, which is responsible for literally billions of federal money coming into the state, uh, may be drastically changed and reduced. And so trying to sort of make sure that our pieces are protected and considerably as important, although not as big um, from a dollar standpoint, um, is, is another challenge um, that we face. So what's trickled through for us at the state level is um, very similar to what was presented uh, on the public health side. Um, there's not a lot of detail yet that's been shared. Um, we do see, and I do want to highlight one bit of interesting news, which is, and I don't know if it's still in there or not, but an additional $500 million fund at the CDC uh, that, that isn't particularly well um, detailed with regard to where that money goes. So there's all these cuts and uh, or proposed cuts and all this potential reorganization. And then over here on the side, there's this extra $500 million fund uh, that has everybody kind of scratching their head wondering what that might um, get used for, how that might get used to fill in the holes. Um, for us um, here in the state, um, our preventive block grant is a relatively small amount of money. It's about $2 million. But this is money that we share actually with the School of Public Health so that we can create opportunities for students and so that we can have our liaison uh, work with the school so that there are opportunities for folks to, you know, do internships and, and uh, look for opportunities um, for employment down the road. So uh, we want to make sure that those block grants um, are, are preserved and a step in the right direction was uh, the, the non-repeal of the ACA uh, because it's still at least loosely tied uh, to some of the policy and some of the reg as it relates to the ACA. Uh, the last thing I'll say is on environmental health uh, and what we're hearing and seeing and a little bit of inside baseball um, based on uh, a memo that uh, Director Pruitt sent to Governor Hickenlooper and others and based on some conversations we've had with the EPA. Um, I, I think the quote was um, 
this is the end of federal coercion um, as uh, sort of his statement about uh, the EPA um, or coercive, I'm sorry, coercive federalism. I got the words backwards. So coercive federalism uh, was um, uh, his impression of uh, prior uh, work of the EPA with the states. So what we're seeing is um, from the EPA at this point uh, a shift in intent and priority to the states. So we don't want to get involved in this, we the EPA. We're going to let you, the state, decide if it's important to you. By the way, if it's important to you, that's great. We're not going to give you any money, uh, but good for you to take it on and, and have it be important. So uh, at this point, you know, it appears that at some point we're going to be asked to do more for less. Um, but um, the good news is, you know, we have a, a governor uh, who is, uh, of course, an advocate for public and environmental health and a, a legislative body that, uh, by and large, um, is supportive uh, of the work uh, that we've done um, to date uh, as well. Uh, but it is a little bit concerning that... Um, uh, rather than sort of rolling things back or just saying, you know, this isn't of concern of the EPA, they're, they're shifting it to say, well, if it's important to the state, you guys go ahead and take that on. Uh, by the way, we're cutting all of the radon program, so if it's important to you at the state, go ahead, but there's no funding for it or lead, uh, environmental lead uh, programs and, and other things that show up as being zeroed out on this potential um, new budget. Um, and I'll close by saying, I mean, we're a long way from that being the final word, because uh, fortunately there is due process uh, for uh, these budgets as, as they wade their way um, through, um, through that process. So um, we'll stay optimistic and um, continue to advocate for science uh, and uh, good sound policy. So, which Sarah would like to go? <laughs> Sure, I'll, be, I'll, I'll, I'll go if you want to. So um, I'm, just because uh, Larry helped me think about the, the good news, which I think is really important, and what um, uh, uh, Dr. Morato asked me to think about what keeps me up at night and what keeps our organizations up at night to sort of frame what we might be talking about. And the, the other good news that is, is happening is that we have very strong partnerships across the state uh, with... Uh, are the three organizations that um, are here and um, many, many others that are all thinking about the implications um, and what is it that we're going to do and how are we going to react both collectively and, um, and either just through the organization. So I, I really, um, what, what we're paying attention to at uh, the Foundation for Public Health and the Environment, which is one of the public health institutes, uh, Sarah is with Colorado Health Institute, which is another public health institute, but where we focus a lot of our work and our energy is uh, that listening to what's going on with the, the communities. And um, uh, sort of oddly, if I may think about the positive thing that's happened in this, because it's, it's really important for me to do that so I don't get too depressed, is um, that we have uh, surfaced um, this uh, some thinking around uh, what are what's important to some of our communities, and we've seen that through uh, an elective process. That is the outcome is what we've seen, and we've um, and with out, as an outcome of elective process, we've also seen and heard some new voices come to um, come to our defense around public health and environmental health issues. And I, I, so what we're paying attention to at our organization is what can we do to lift those voices, both the ones that are uh, had previously not been heard and voiced their opinions very strongly through our elective process, and also uh, the voices of the people who are out advocating, literally walking the streets. And how do we um, spend some time uh, listening and focusing on their energies and trying to generate some solutions. Don't get me wrong. We are paying attention. We're concerned. Uh, a lot of the resources that we have uh, coming through the foundation are federal resources as well. Many of the resources that you have uh, mentioned. And we partner very um, deliberately with the university 
especially with funds from NIH, AHRQ, uh, the HRSA program, and all of those things are things that we partner with the university. So we are paying attention to those, but I'll talk a little bit more about our, some of uh, our ideas around uh, this concept of uh, authentic, true community engagement and working as system partners because uh, we're going to have to generate some solutions and we're going to have to take advantage of the mess that Tony referred to um, and see if we can um, get the best uh, outcomes that we can given the situation. So I will throw it to you right sure. now. Sure. Hello. Good afternoon. Um, I want to focus my comments in three areas that I think connect well with what we've been talking about. I think the first issue that we at the Colorado Health Institute are have been concerned about for more than just the last 120 days or whatever we're into is really the growing skepticism around the use of data and evidence, um, really at all levels of government. And we saw that certainly through the election campaign, um, and we're seeing that play out in different ways under a new administration. And as an organization that really is rooted in providing evidence-based insight and analysis to inform policy decision-making, and working very closely with our partners at the table, in particular CDPHE, on ensuring that Coloradans have access to the data that you all need to do your work, that is something that we are very concerned about and that we've been spending a lot of time thinking about internally and how do we prepare for that. We've seen some pushback. I think um, that climate at the federal level has emboldened different communities and different uh, local organizations. And in particular, there were a couple of budget scares just through this past year, um, this, through this past, this current budget cycle that we're in that the legislature is working on in terms of funding for the Healthy Kids Colorado Survey, which the Department of Public Health and Environment administers with the Department of Education and human services, um, and in addition, some questions around the immunization registry, for example. And fortunately, in Colorado, we have, we have a unique environment where people are pragmatic and practical, and cooler heads prevailed, and those issues were resolved. But I think it was just uh, it, the fact that it continues to be a discussion is always something that we want to keep an eye on. Um, the second piece which it relates to, I think, is the bigger picture funding and some of the timing. And just to provide some, uh, some numbers, 8% uh, of CDPHE's budget is general revenue or general fund um, based on the last current budget that we have. And it feels like it takes a little bit of time. It might take some time if we do have to start to shift as federal funds draw down and the state might need to backfill some of those important priorities. It takes some time and some conversation with legislators to get them to understand the value of some of these public health mm -hmm. programs. And we've seen that over time over the several years with um, proven public health interventions that have now gained and garnered general fund support. Some of that Larry talked about, like school-based health centers, for example. But that requires communication and data and relationship building and really just education of the General Assembly. And that might take more time than what we might have given some of these um, decisions that will be happening over the next six to eight months. Also, we will have a new um, administration in 2019. And those are, we just, we will have some changes. And we also have sort of a turning over of a General Assembly given our term limits that um, loosen the, the institutional knowledge. I think the last piece I just want to highlight, we, we skimmed through it, Tony skimmed through it quickly in terms of the impact of the Affordable Care Act. As a health policy research organization, we spend a lot of time thinking about Colorado's health policy decisions and the interplay between Colorado's decisions and the federal government. And certainly the ACA was a big turning point for that. Um, and there are a lot of components of the ACA that get a lot of attention. Um, no one thinks of them as public health mm -hmm. interventions, but they really are. Things like the essential health benefits and cost, um, the no cost sharing for preventive services, um, the Medicaid expansion, of course, which brought more people into coverage, which covers things like substance use treatment. But I think a bigger picture, too, is that as people gained coverage, it um, allowed local public health to be less of a gap filler and be able to uh, start to shift some of its attention upstream. And should we, sh should we change our coverage over time? Should Medicaid financing change? And the state has to make different decisions about who it covers and at what levels that will impact local public health directly. And I'm not sure that people think about that. I'm going to stop there. Thank you all. Um, we now have the opportunity for people in the audience to ask questions, and I'll bring the mic around.
Are, is, are there any questions coming in from Zoom? Okay. So putting on the dean hat right for the school, so in light of what you're saying, what could the, the School of Public Health be doing that would be working towards better partnering with the state agencies and, and groups as, as you? How, how might we, it, my sense is we're all kind of trying to understand this in our own isolated. You talked, Sarah, about how we're coming, groups are coming together. How, yeah. how might the school be, either through its students or its faculty or, or staff, in ways that could be, helping with that partnering? I, I, I think the steps that we've made that I've seen happen with uh, the, the position that, uh, I'm sorry, I don't remember her name that holds the position, that liaison position, um, and bringing um, people and, uh, that are students, currently students, and driving them out into uh, working at our agencies. We host students all the time. Um, is a really important step to get, um, I think, to sort of land on my concern as well. As I, and I think the state of Colorado, especially the state health department, has the same uh, bubble happening with people that are eligible for retirement. At least I, that's been my, and that we, to help with uh, capturing institutional knowledge and best practices and understanding about sort of how the nooks and crannies work in the different public health. I think that's been a beautiful thing that I've seen emerge just recently. So holding on to that and making sure that that works. I think the other thing too is getting a little bit more creative about, uh, about what it is the possibilities are within the collaborations and um, making sure we're sitting around uh, the tables thinking about what our end goals are collectively, and then figuring out how we can each uh, commit to doing certain things. But I have seen nothing but um, progress and improvement on that across the board, and, and really utilizing us to help generate solutions in sort of this wave of change that we're experiencing. Um, and and we're, I, I'm purely of the belief that we can only do it together. And that, um, so that when we have that opportunity of sitting across the table saying, you're fighting for this money, I'm fighting for this money, by the way, I'm doing it right now with the university, it's fascinating. Uh, not fighting for, but applying for the same resource. But there's that sort of friendly, okay, let's hope somebody gets it, and then when it lands in our state, let's also figure out how we can work to make that as mostly successful as we can. So those types of conversations for me are very important. Yeah, I think um, as a, uh, an advocate voice, um, what I found is that, um, you know, we try to be credible uh, as a Department of Public Health and Environment, and one of our um, sort of tenets is to make sure that we provide evidence-based information. Having said that, as a political appointee, uh, you know, trying to then present that information uh, you know, the, the legislators don't necessarily want to hear from me or even from members of our department. Um, there's a lot of credibility that comes from the school uh, and from faculty and students and uh, related um, stakeholders, um, especially when it comes to science. And, um, you know, we, we might not always agree on uh, some of the sort of end product or end results, but uh, we all agree that science is important um, and, um, and staying true to um, science and uh, objectivity and um, ha having to fight battles about, you know, the uh, public health impact of immunizations um, and to fight battles about fluoridation of community water systems. I mean, just seems, you know, to be blunt crazy. Uh, but we can't be the voice necessarily uh, for those type of things as these things um, come under attack um, from a budgetary standpoint as well as a content standpoint. That, that's a great role for the school and for the students and the faculty. I don't know that I would add anything. Yeah. I could just add a couple of things to that. Uh, you know, a lot of areas, when you look at the mission of our schools and programs, comes down to engaging communities. And I think it only is going to be uh, more impactful going forward as we see either federal inaction or, you know, federal benign neglect. So uh, I, there was an interesting op-ed by Michael Bloomberg in uh, the New York Times based on a new book he has coming out where uh, so much can be done at the local, state, 
and business level to advance environmental health, environmental protections, absent anything at the federal level. And it just takes an engaged citizenry to do that. Similarly, um, just ran a conference on population health and working on the social determinants of health, where so many of those uh, of the solutions are going to be at the local level. So I have seen a lot of schools uh, increasing their attention to providing leadership training to their graduates to on how to organize at the community level without resources. And that's a real skill set. But I think going forward, uh, your graduates will play a key organizing leadership role uh, throughout the communities and, and make real progress. And they also play a key role as a key health informant to a community. And um, sometimes it's positive, sometimes it's negative. Nobody wants to be first in syphilis rates rather than uh, a positive. You can get a lot more attention from politicians if you point out the negatives that they don't want to be. Uh, just to, to build on the leadership, um, I think uh, we've seen a, a nice uh, collaboration with the school around uh, the uh, leadership academy that we run out of the Foundation for Public Health and Environment, which was an originally CDC funded. It got all its funds yanked for uh, various reasons uh, 12 years ago, and we've been able to maintain it. I think you're a graduate. Too, right? Of, so this is Rye Hill that I'm talking about and really taking advantage of um, development of leadership skills uh, and, 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 and developing that. I, I also want to share an example because you're talking about research. Um, a lot of what we do at the Foundation for Public Health Environment is work in community engaged research. And um, we had a, a community member down in uh, New Mexico. I'm hoping I'm um, choosing the right state. I'm looking actually at one of my staff to see if it's a yes or no. Anyhow, they couldn't get money for the research that they really wanted to do. Um, and so they crowdsourced um, r money to do research. And it was bizarre to us. And we we're thinking, huh. And it actually was a partnership with a researcher and a community uh, in this area that we're really interested. And I'm not saying this is the solution to go out and, you know, do a GoFundMe page for every type of research that we need. But it was a really nice, fresh, innovative way to think about getting money that also, but that went to New Mexico researcher as well as the the community member to do some research. And so there, in the, in the folks that we have coming through your school now, um, uh, we're, we're a lot of them, I, I happen to teach with you all, um, are, are from this generation that this is not um, foreign to them. It's foreign to me. But um, they're teaching me a lot about creative ways and innovative resource development that I would have never thought about. And we need to ask those questions of the students passing through these walls about um, helping us think in innovative ways uh, to, do, to develop research uh, funding. And I think they've got some answers. We just need to ask the right questions. While we're talking about students, I mean, one of the things that worries me is that with the federal cutbacks, that students are going to say, gee, public health is going down. This isn't a good career choice. I mean, what, what kinds of strategies can you suggest or that are, other schools are using to ensure that, that students don't give up on the idea of, of careers in public health while we're in this downtime? Well, some of the things I've seen is, um, you know, uh, an increased emphasis on some basic skills that are more transferable uh, between a variety of careers. Uh, an enhancement in interprofessional education. Uh, there's been a lot of interprofessional education within the health system, but building new partnerships outside of the health system or health enterprise walls uh, that make employers realize that there are benefits uh, to the skills that public health graduates have in architecture and city planning, et cetera, um, and preparing students with the communication skills to be successful at communicating no matter where they go. I have to say there's a lot of concern about whether our graduates have uh, the essential communication skills they need to both be community organizers, community leaders, but to also advance research and advance policy and evidence. 
yes, there has been a lot of criticism and the of the administration um, on evidence and and um, research. Uh, I think that should um, drive us to make sure that the research we do is even better than it is now. We need to maximize the research we do, make sure that we're really advancing research that matters, and do it really well and really compelling. So. Yeah, I think um, from, from where I am, I mean, we, we need to continue to try to innovate um, for students. Um, we look for ways to be opportunistic. Um, outside of traditional public health and environmental health um, for roles and for careers for students coming out with those skills. Um, and so retooling, um, we, we, we tend to emphasize population health quite a bit more than either of the um, sort of more siloed terms of public or environmental health uh, because that gets a little bit more... Um, that gets a little bit more grab uh, in the broader community, and we find that um, there's a lot of folks uh, in municipal government uh, as well as in industry that are looking for expertise in population health with a concentration in environmental health or with a concentration in um, preventive health or public health. And so, um, you know, we may have to work together a little bit more uh, on that to um, make sure that the career path, that the curriculum supports that kind of career path uh, because, uh, you know, this may be an opportunity uh, to try to see how, you know, we, we preserve the field, but not in ways that uh, it's been preserved um, before. Because, you know, again, people take us for granted, right? Um, you know, they, they, they take what we do for granted, and we just have to find a way to a appeal to um, what's important to um, the general public at, at, the, at this particular time. It, it goes to what you said, Sarah, about listening to the millennials about, you know, what, what's going on and, um, and even the Gen Xers. No, we don't hear it from the baby boomers anymore. But, um, you, know, it's, uh, you know, it's about um, not sort of addressing um, greenhouse gases and, and, and respiratory irritants, but gosh, how do we keep that brown cloud from coming back? Mm -hmm. um, and so in, 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 in my particular industry, um, I am interested in making sure that we're doing what we can to, you know, be good citizens uh, as it relates uh, to population health. And so they're hiring those kind of people. If I could just add one other thing, you know, uh, and, and Larry's comments reminded me of it. I, I would really encourage your brightest students to think more expansively about opportunities for internships and fellowships in places they haven't been before. One, it exposes them to a new area of, of uh, a new sector of knowledge, but it also educates where they're, the places they uh, are doing their internship. It gets them thinking about how to use the resources of the public health community in ways they hadn't thought of before. Lots of opportunities in this state around population health impacts of marijuana. So, <laughs> go for it. And there's money there. <laughs> there's money there. <laughs> and money. <laughs> yes. Yeah, so, um, just going back to the comment about um, talking about you know fights uh, around the efficacy of, of vaccines and um, kind of related conversations around um, like shared values of, of science and the importance of science and objectivity. Um, Kind of pushing back on that a little bit, I mean, what we're seeing is that that message maybe isn't resonating with folks, uh, clearly. Um, so I'm just curious if you can talk a little bit more about how uh, public health and how perhaps the school in particular can go about uh, finding messages that work that are not just uh, about science and um, if you have any ad advice about what messages you think work best. That's such a great comment because, you know, we are challenged with trying to figure out how we change that message uh, so that it resonates. You know, the, um, the kind of bully pulpit for that during this legislative session has been um, non-medical exemptions, personal belief exemptions. And, um, you know, we got into a fight about uh, the form because um, we felt that um, rather than just quickly signing something and not knowing what you were signing so that your child could stay in school, 
wasn't the right way to do it, that we needed to inform people of the risks of not immunizing their children just the way that, and I'm a pediatrician, just the way that, you know, pediatricians and other healthcare providers educate parents on the potential risks associated with immunizations. So there's a, there's a, a, a messaging strategy uh, that involves parity, just trying to bring things to the same level, not trying to sort of go after it, you know, that much further. And I hate to bring it back to marijuana, but, you know, with marijuana, it was the same thing. You know, it was about sort of treating marijuana no differently than we would anything like it, whether it was in the context of a medicine or whether it was in the context of a food. Um, and so trying to find that plane was a much more effective messaging platform um, for us. But we have quite a bit more to learn about that because, you know, what we find is, you know, people who've made up their mind uh, about vaccines one way or the other aren't going to be swayed by a form, uh, which is why, you know, we crafted this compromise because we weren't willing to risk losing funding for the entire immunization registry um, just to um, sort of be obstinate about uh, what the form contained. Yeah. You know, I want to come hug you because what you've brought up is this issue of uh, understanding people's values and, and wh why they're here and he or here. And we tend to have a lot of extremes in the realm of public health, despite the data, despite the evidence that we have. And so um, we've really started to embrace within um, the training in public health, which um, we do have phenomenal opportunities here at the university to be hearing about this, and this, this concept of authentic community engagement and figuring out what people are valuing and why they're valuing it. And not to necessarily nudge them in a certain direction, but try to, with that understanding, capture um, that that listening and the understanding to see what it is that how we could maybe influence because we're not in my opinion not doing the greatest job of getting some public health agendas pushed into communities so we got to kind of stop that and and really and we're doing a good job we've got amazing examples all over the place with the folks at the department that are doing phenomenal work folks here that are doing phenomenal work all over the place and so we've got to learn from each other about how we're, there are people that are tapping into values immediately and understanding that. Um, it's a hard one, though. It is, but we invest more in um, communication and culture. Uh, I'll give one more specific example. Um, and I'm sorry it's from marijuana again because it's, it's <laughs> new it. and it's a new field. But we would think that the way to get kids not to use marijuana is by telling them over and over again, it's bad for your brain, it's bad for your brain. And then when we got kids together and tested messages, yeah. that message didn't resonate at all. Uh, what resonated was marijuana could get in the way of what's next. You know, so it could impact my ability to graduate high school or get my driver's license or get a job. Yeah. And so if you've seen the campaign, it's, it's primarily directed toward teens, so we're using a lot of those channels to communicate this message. But the message is all about, you know, not getting in the way of what's next. It says absolutely nothing about it's melting your brain. Um, but, you know, and, and it's been more effective. And the school is helping us research that effectiveness, uh -huh, yeah. so it's a good partnership between us and the school. Do I see other hands up back here? Um, I've heard it suggested more recently, I think, and this is kind of a polarizing issue, that public health seek partnerships with private industry more. Um, and I was hoping you could talk a little bit about your thoughts and concerns or, you know, what, what do you think? Uh, just from my perspective, yes. I mean, I think it, it, uh, it, it's, it's critically important, um, it, especially when you realize the significant percentage of people who get their health insurance through employer-based coverage. Uh, workplace wellness, the incentives can be legitimately positive, need to be carefully implemented. Um, I think uh, business, I do a lot in the population health sphere, and you really need to engage the purchasers 
of insurance uh, into population health, and you can't do that without engaging with industry. It needs to be done, obviously, ethically and et cetera. I am a little concerned. You know, often you'll hear, oh, we need to have, you know, engage partners. Uh, but it's usually, I'd like to engage you in a partnership and please bring you a checkbook. Mm-hmm. And it has to really be a true engagement and partnership if it is going to work. It has to be more than just a sharing of money. We have this debate newly uh, emerging for us around environmental health issues. Um, And so, um, because there's lots of folks that would like to partner that historically have been bad actors in our society. And uh, so we spend a lot of time with our board and our uh, senior directorship looking at um, that sort of doing it carefully and thinking through it. And uh, really important to have that conversation while you're embarking on that. We have some very strict lines about certain products that we won't dance with, obviously, but um, more and more there's more private sector that uh, are interested either to participate in public health initiatives because they're trying to do better, um, but we're not quite, I I have to say sometimes it's really tricky, So we, but we don't say no, it's just a matter of let's talk and explore what your agenda is, what your values are so we can see what we're talking about. No, you're trying to capitalize on a public health stamp to make your product or your project appear more palatable. We've we've encountered that a few times as well. It's really tough. Um, But I think it's interesting. We have, so at CHI, we have many undergraduates who then work for us for a while and then go on to graduate school. And we have two that applied to graduate school this past year, and both of them were only looking at dual degree projects. Mm So business and public health, public affairs and public health, public policy, public health. They were, no one was, neither felt that they could stay just focused in a public health program. I think in our world, it's a little different. Uh, You know, we're the regulators um, in, um, uh, and we engage stakeholders, that being industry, depending on the field of regulation. So, um, every hospital in the state, every nursing home in the state, uh, you know, so it's, you know, for-profit, not-for-profit. For and, of course, everybody wants to have a good relationship with the regulator, and we'd like to have a good relationship so that we get access to honest information. You know, um, on the environmental side, for example, uh, a, a large part of um, regulation on oil and gas um, operators and their air emissions is based on self-reporting and self-monitoring. Um, and we were asked to put together a fiscal note uh, for uh, one of the legislators to say, what would it cost and how many people would you need to, how many additional people would you need to employ to inspect with infrared cameras every single oil and gas well and tank in the state? And I think that last count, it was about $15 million more and about 200 plus more FTEs um, just to get out and do that. Because um, we, we just don't have the resources, nor, you know, I think does the public have the appetite to grow government mm-hmm. uh, to the point where uh, you have to go out and, um, and do that yourself as the regulator. So. Uh, there, there's quite a bit in anything that we regulate. Again, back to the hospitals, there's um, self-reporting of incidents um, that occur. Um, and so it, it does require that you have enough of a relationship with the private sector um, so that um, you, know, you can do your job. Time for one or two more questions or comments from the audience. Anything online coming in? No? Going once? <laughs> going twice? Um, I wonder if any of the panelists want to make any last statements before we close. Uh, not really. I, I just think, um, <laughs> like to see the Affordable Care Act come up again. And I, I went through the slides very quickly, but Larry made an important point. On the very first page of the uh, repeal bill, was the repeal of the Prevention and Public Health Fund. And uh, people don't realize that was a key part of the ACA process, at least. Provides a billion dollars for prevention activities. It's intended to fund new and innovative prevention.
Commission activities, but it, um, it actually didn't. It went to existing programs. But that it, it amounts to 12% of the CTC's budget, and much of it is uh, funding that goes through to state and local communities. And one of the good things about the, the repeal not passing was that that billion dollars per year it's actually about $930 million now, uh, is, it will remain and does provide essential services. So stay tuned to the ACA. Well, I'd just like on behalf of the school to thank all of, all of you for coming and all of you for being here um, for stimulating conversation, and hopefully it will be continued as we go forward. Thank you. Good